We uh, are in the book of Hebrews in chapter 7. And in Hebrews chapter 7, the writer of Hebrews introduces this concept in this person called Melchizedek. So the writer for seven chapters has used uh, several different Jewish icons and he's trying to make the case that Jesus is better than those. Everything that they worship, Jesus is better. He gets chapter 7, this Melchizedek character, he doesn't say he's better than Melchizedek. He says Jesus is a high priest after the order of this Melchizedek guy. Now, very few theologians, and I am not a theologian, I'm a student. Very few theologians believe that this Melchizedek guy is Jesus. Yet they believe that God manifested in the flesh hundreds of times in the Old Testament. They just, for whatever reason, don't believe that Melchizedek was Jesus. Because they can't wrap their brain around God not just coming in, doing something, and leaving. And what I believe is this Melchizedek character was in and out of Abraham's life for years. And I think he knew him. And I dare you to find another person in the Old Testament that God appeared to face to face more than Abraham. But when you read it, you don't catch it. It says the Lord appeared unto Abraham. And so when you see Abraham see the Lord manifest that as a, as a man on earth, he recognizes who he is. He knows who he is. I believe it's because he's Melchizedek. Now that's what I've been trying to prove, and it's taken us some very strange places, and tonight will be just as strange. So we got to get there. I got to go fast. It will be recorded. Hopefully it gets on there. And you'll need to listen to it again, I'm sure. So let's go. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. We will start. <clears throat> Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Talking about a priest, a high priest that went beyond the veil. 20, whether the forerunner is for us entered. The forerunner was the Levitical priesthood. They always went behind the veil. Remember when Jesus died, the veil was rent. <coughs> Even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. First time he's ever mentioned. Well, you say, who in the cat hair is this in the New Testament? So we jump right to chapter 7. There is no break. Chapter 7, verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. First time the tithe is even mentioned. First being by interpretation king of righteousness. And after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Sound like an eternal uh, spiritual God being to you? But made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now, Consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tithe or the tenth of the spoils. And barely they that are of the sons of Levi, who received the office of the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, have a commandment to take a tenth or a tithe of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, the Jews though they come out of the loins of Abraham. This Levitical law, which was started after Mount Sinai with Moses, they came out of the loins of Abraham. But he, whose descent is not counted from them, received tithes of Abraham. So he's making a point. This Melchizedek was greater than any Levitical high priest that received a tenth or a tithe from a descendant of Abraham because this Melchizedek received a tithe from Abraham. Everybody with me? And blessed him that had the promise. That was Abraham. Abraham had the promise. And without all contradiction, 
the less is blessed of the better. You know, you can't bless someone unless you have something to bless them with. And here men that die receive tithes. The Levitical priests, they all died. They received tithes. But there he received them. There Melchizedek received them. Of whom it is witness that he liveth. He never did die. Well, no, he didn't die because he's God. And as I may so say, Levi also, who received tithe, paid tithes in Abraham. So they got credit for the tithe that Abraham paid Melchizedek. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So, he's making a case that this Melchizedek, I believe, is Jesus. So, he references this story that's in Genesis 14. And there were four giant, or Nephilim, or Rephim, those are the words used in the Bible, kings that attacked the five cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And remember, they had them where they were like paying them um, uh, hush money, or they were uh, like mafia style. Well, finally, the five cities with Sodom and Gomorrah decided, we're not paying no more. And so there was a war broke out. And these four giant war armies came in and attacked those five giant, full of giant and hybrid people cities. And the Bible's very plain to tell you, Sodom and Gomorrah and those other three cities were full of hybrid people. They may not have all been 50 feet tall. They may not have all been 15 feet tall. They may have, some of them, not had the gene of giganticism, but they were all hybrid DNA altered not human people. So they took them and they took them off. So let's go there. Genesis 14 verse 8. And there went out the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of Adma and the king of Zebulun and the king of Bela, the same as Zorah. And they joined battle with them in the vow of Siddim with Cherdelor no more, that's the king that's over these four armies that's attacked and took siege of these five cities. The king of Elam, and with Tidal, king of nations, and uh, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arok, king of Elasar, uh, four kings with five. So it was four against five. But they're all giants, they're all hybrid. And the veil of Siddim was full of slime pits. And the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there. And they that remaineth fled to the mountains. Now, I want to go back there just for a second because I think it's important. It said that the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and they fell there. So it seems to me that the Bible's clear that the king of Sodom died, right? Verse 11, and they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. And they took Lot, Abraham's brother's son, who dealt in Sodom and his goods and departed. And there came one that had escaped and told Abraham, the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Ishkol, and brother of Anor, and these were confederate with Abram. So he had some help. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and he smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also, and the people. So they brought them all back. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedor and Moore. Now, I thought he was dead. Now, what we've been making our case is what they were doing in Sodom and Gomorrah is way worse than homosexuality. What they were doing in Sodom and Gomorrah caused God's wrath to destroy them. I don't think anybody's done it since. God's not, as far as I know, rained down his wrath and fire and brimstone on a whole group of people since. 
Now he will. They must have been doing something, and the Bible calls it exceedingly wicked, very grievous. Well, I thought the dude was dead. Either they had the ability to resurrect him, or it might be a reference to the devil as the actual king of Sodom. I tend to think, I think they might have had the ability for longevity and even maybe the ability to resurrect him. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shava, which is the king's dell. Now, it can't be another king. Notice this very carefully. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer. So there's something here. I thought he was dead. Could they have the ability to raise him from the dead? Well, I don't know. I don't have any scripture for that, but I got a whole bunch of scripture. I felt sorry for Tim and Kenny tonight to have to punch all this scripture in there, but it is a Bible study. So look at verse 18. And, the, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. First mention of that in the Bible. And he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which has delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. So Abraham gives Melchizedek tithes of the booty. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods for thyself. So he wants the people. The people are valuable to him. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abraham rich. Save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men which went with me, Anar, Eshkol, Mamre, let them take their portion. So Abraham won't take anything from this king of Sodom. Well, what is going on? What is happening here? This Melchizedek brings bread and wine. Bread and wine. Well, whatever they're doing at Sodom was exceedingly wicked. The most wicked thing that we can't even imagine. It was so wicked. Look at Genesis 18, 20 and 21. Look. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous. Now this is right before he destroys it. Look what it says. I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. Now, greater men than me have taken that word there, the cry of it, and they've done all kinds of word studies on it and things. And it very well can be interpreted the cries of the little children are actually the cries of the little ones. So you have something going on here um, with little ones. Well, it's all through the Bible. So what were these people doing? Let me ask you something. Would it be too far-fetched to say maybe they were sacrificing their children to the devil? And part of that was drinking their blood and eating their flesh? It's been practiced throughout all of known history, and it's practiced today. Now, today we have uh, this thing called adrenal chrome. If you've been here at any time, you've heard me talk about it. But um, for a long time... Hollywood let it out, but everybody said it was a joke. 
Now it's not a joke. You can, uh, you can Google it. What they've done is they've made it into a drug. And the blood of infants. There are places uh, around the world where when you get, I believe it's 16 years old, you can donate your blood to these places, and they're called basically a young blood factory. So you got an old 80-year-old man or an 80-year-old woman. You can go in there, you can buy a pint of 16-year-old blood, and you walk out a new person because young blood makes you younger. And what they really like is infant blood. And what they really, really like is umbilical cord blood. Now, if you think that's crazy, you're just in the dark. Now, there are people, real rich people, famous people, whatever, they're hooked on this adrenal chrome. What they say is, I don't, I mean, I don't know, but this is what they testify that human blood is the most addictive substance on the planet and uh, the most intoxicating. So, these cries of the little one, what are these people doing? Well, it's kind of strange. Look at this, Genesis 9, verse 4. And we got to go in a hurry, and we're trying to go fast. I wish I could take an hour on each point. This is what God said before the law. This is what God told after the flood. He said, but the flesh with the life thereof, the life in the flesh, what constitutes the life, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. Now, don't you think that's strange? Why can't you eat blood? Why? Well, God said don't do it. Because the life is in the blood. Well, what does that mean? Does that actually mean what that says? Yeah, I just, I don't write the book. I just read it. So this is before the law, Genesis 9, 4. God said, whatever you do, don't eat the blood. Why? So Jacob before he dies, he gives a prophecy to his sons. Watch this prophecy, Genesis 49, verses 8. Now, you've got to catch all this. It's going to be too much for your brain to take, so you'll have to watch it again. Judah, thou art he whom... Now, he's given prophecy to each one of his brothers, and some of you guys are smarter than others. Judah was one of Jacob, or Israel's sons. He is the lineage... Jesus was born in the line or the lineage of the tribe of Judah. The insignia of that Judah is a lion. So Jesus was the original OG lion king. He's a king, he's a lion. It wasn't that cartoon thing, it was Jesus. Now Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Watch. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion. And as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? Watch this. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh, which is a, another name for the Messiah, or Jesus, come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Binding his foal unto the vine, his foal, well, that's a... And his ass's coat unto the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Well, that's a prophecy about Jesus coming back, but he just ties blood there to a grape or to wine. So before the law, drinking blood or eating blood is against God's law. It's prohibited. During the law, Leviticus 17.10, 
Leviticus 17.10 says, And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among you that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood and will cut him off from among his people. That's under the law. That was a law. Now you need to ask yourself, why? I mean, who cares? If you cut yourself, don't you ever, hmm. Well, that ain't what God's talking about. This eating and drinking of blood must be very grievous, must be extremely wicked, must be an abomination, must be blasphemous. You must be drinking that blood instead of some other blood that God intended for you to have. So... After the law, during the church age, the age of grace, is there anything said about it? Sure there is. When the Gentiles began to be saved and born again, the apostles all went to Jerusalem and they had a, a symposium in Jerusalem. They didn't know what to do with these Gentiles. And when they got done, this is what they handed down. James, the half-brother of Jesus, Peter, Paul, all the apostles are there. Peter, Paul, and Mary, okay? So Acts 15, verse 20. But that we write unto them, they said, well, what are we going to tell these Gentiles? Here's what they said. That they abstain from pollution of idols. That they, they can't worship idols and Jesus Christ. And from fornication. You can, you can, that's not a good, I mean, you, can, you know, quit it. And from things strangled and from blood. Why? You know, in the South, they used to make, what was that, uh, blood cheese or something like blood that? Sausage. Blood sausage. Yeah, what is blood sausage? Bunch of, just a bunch of coagulated blood? Do they cook it? That's nasty. Look at verse 29. They say it again. That you abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood. I mean, I really, I don't want to hammer it home, but why? Why, why, why? Well, maybe after tonight you'll get a little bit of an idea. The first public miracle of Moses was he changed the water into blood. The first sign in Egypt. The first public miracle of Jesus was he changed the water into wine. Wine is a type of blood all through the Bible. So the first time you see this type or symbolism of what we call the Lord's Supper is in Melchizedek. The high priest Melchizedek, the high priest, the king of Jerusalem, brings out bread and wine. Look at Genesis 14, 18. What does he do? He brings forth bread and wine. What is he teaching there? I believe he's teaching. He's showing here the salvation of God. And the salvation of God is bought and paid for through his body and his blood. Look at Leviticus 17, verse 10. We're getting there. We're going fast. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel... Or of the strangers that sojourn among you that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood and will cut him off from among his people. God's very serious about this. Verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Do you think they don't have that figured out? And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourn among you eat blood. Well, the devil does it, right? And whatsoever man there be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, which hunteth and catches any beast or fowl that may be eaten, he shall even pour out the blood thereof and cover it with dust. For it is the life of all flesh. 
The blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore, I said unto the children of Israel, You shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh. For the life of all flesh is in the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth it shall be cut off. Well, that seems like a pretty bad uh, punishment for just eating some blood. How many of you like a raw steak? They didn't know everything about it that we know now, but they knew quite a bit, and they may have known more than we can even imagine. When you consume the blood of another human being, that's an uh, abomination to God because you're getting life from outside of yourself and not from God. You went around God and you've gotten life. God is the life giver. Now, eventually, I think they got to the point that they figured out how to sustain life. That's the goal. Isn't that the goal? That's the goal, ain't it? And it's his blood, the blood of God, that gives us eternal life. And if you try to get it any other way, it's an abomination. So in Sunday school, I asked this question. Why do the children of Israel long to go back to Egypt? Year after year after year, every chance they get, they go back to the worship of Egypt. Why do they always want to go back to the worship of Egypt? That's what they loved. Why did they love it? It was devil worship. The Bible is very clear that the children of Israel were worshiping the devil along with the Egyptians. And it entailed infant sacrifices and throwing their babies into a furnace. But they did not throw their babies into the furnace until they had drained them and drank their blood. They just threw their bodies in the furnace. And the Bible tells you they did that. Well, maybe, maybe they, the reason for their unrealistic longing to go back is maybe because they're having withdrawals. I asked the question in Sunday school, and Rusty, uh, Rusty, I don't even think he knew what he was saying. He said, well, that was, that was their buzz. That's what got them high. Maybe that's exactly right. Maybe they were missing that form of worship. Now, it doesn't matter where you go. You can go anywhere. If you don't, if you don't want to go very far, you don't even have to cross the pond. You can just go right straight south, and you'll see the world's uh, greatest blood letters were south of our border. The Aztec people, they had pyramids. Why do Aztec people have pyramids like Egyptians? They practice the same worship. It don't matter where you go, there's pyramids all over the world. And they all practice drinking blood. It's the greatest secret in the world. But when you figure it out, it unlocks a large part of the Bible. They aren't in Canaan land, no time until they started up again. Why? I want to show you something. Joshua 10.13 quotes a book called Jasher. Joshua 10.13, And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, and the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. It is it not written in the book of Jasher? Now this book of Jasher was a book widely known by Moses and Joshua and all these. It's an antiquity book. It's older than they can even fathom. It's also in 2 Samuel 1.18, quotes this book of Jasher. Also, he bade them teach children of Judah to use the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. So, maybe the book of Jasher might have something to say. I just was trying to tell you it's quoted in the Bible. Maybe it has some credibility. Let me read you this passage in the book of Jasher. Now this book is old. Watch this. 
And when the Lord had inflicted the plague upon Pharaoh, king of Egypt, he asked his wise men and sorcerers to cure him. So Pharaoh don't want to die, right? So he asked his wise men and his sorcerers to cure him. And his wise men and sorcerers said unto him, that if the blood of little children were put into the wounds, he would be healed. Hmm. And Pharaoh hearkened to them and sent his ministers to Goshen. Now remember, that's where the Israeli people lived, in the land of Goshen, which was a suburb of Egypt. So he sent them, his ministers to Goshen, to the children of Israel to take their little children. And Pharaoh's ministers went and took the infants of the children of Israel from the bosom of their mothers by force. And they brought them to Pharaoh daily, a child each day. And the physicians killed them and applied them to the plague. Thus did they all the days. And the number of the children which Pharaoh slew were 375. Now, you understand what you just heard? This Pharaoh understood that possibly he could be healed, his sores would heal, if they put infant's blood on the sores. It was practiced everywhere, especially in G Egypt. So were they right? Yes, they were right. It's very healing. Young blood makes you young. It gives you life apart from God. So last time we went and took a trip. Let's go there, 1 Kings 14, 22. 1 Kings 14, 22 said, And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. So whatever they're doing here, it's above any sin that anybody in the past had done. For they also built them high places and images and groves on every high hill and under every green tree. Anytime you read of a grove in the Bible, in the Old Testament, that's on a high place and they plant trees that go straight up and that's a place of worship. That's where the sacrifices were taken and that's for another time. And there were also sodomites in the land. Now, we talked about this last time. Let me say it real fast. Today, the word sodomite, when you hear sodomite, you think of a homosexual. But in the Bible, it's just uh, saying a person that lived in Sodom. It's a sodomite, like a Tulsaite or a Barsvilleite or whatever, Israelite. So there were sodomites in the land. Now, if my theory's right, and these sodomites had figured this thing out, they're spreading it around. Well, if you could figure out how to help people live forever, how much money could you get? You'd be pretty valuable, wouldn't you? What do you think every doctor in town is, what's he valuable for? Well, we think that he can keep us alive. Am I the only one got this figured out? Watch. Guess so. And there were also sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Well, who were the nations that he cast out? He cast out the Nephilim, the giants, the hybrid people out of his land. Well, they had it figured out. They had heavenly knowledge. They were doing all kinds of crazy things. And the one thing they were doing was eating each other. When the witnesses came back, they said, hey, these people eat each other. They're drinking their blood. They're eating each other. Well, they had it figured out, right? And there were also sodomites. Okay, we said we read that enough, right? Let's go to 1 Kings 15, just the next chapter. Watch this. And as it did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. And he took away the sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols that his father had made. So he got rid. Now listen, don't let your mind go. He got rid of all the homosexuals. No, he didn't run out all the LGBTQ people. He got rid of the people who were residents of Sodom. Okay? This is something that needs to stand out to you. 
What made these people different? 1 Kings 22, 45. Watch this. 1 Kings. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat and his might that he showed and how he warred, are they not written in the book of Chronicles and the kings of Judah? And the remnant of the Sodomites, which remained in the days of his father Asa, Asa he took out of the land. Well, there's something about these people. Look at 2 Kings 23, verse 4. And the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, and the priests of the second order, and the keepers of the door, to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal. Now, Baal is devil worship. It's Satan worship. And for the grove, that's where they did their sacrifices. And for all the host of heaven. And he burned them without Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron and carried the ashes of them unto Bethel. And he put down the, the adulterous priest whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high place in the cities of Judah and in the place round about Jerusalem, them also that burned incense unto the devil. It didn't take them no time. They started up every time. God puts them back up, they fall again. To the sun and to the moon and to the planets and to all the hosts of heaven. And he brought out the grove from the house of the Lord without Jerusalem unto the brook Kidron and burned it at the brook Kidron and stamped it small to powder and cast the powder thereon upon the graves of the children of the people. And he break down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord where the women wove hangings for the grove. What are these, these Sodomites that got a house right next to the house of the Lord? These Sodomite practices, whatever they were, had infiltrated their worship. Their worship was worshiping idols. And eventually the Bible tells you they don't worship idols. They worship the devil. But these women are weaving pretty things to put in the groves because, you know, you like decoration and you're Satan worshiping, right? But the Sodomites had their house right next door. The practices were the practices of Sodom. So, last time we left you with this story in Judges, Judges 19, Verses 1 and 2. Well, hey, we're doing good. All right, and it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel that there was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. Now, a concubine is not a wife. A concubine is just a concubine, and I hope you understand what that means. And his concubine played the whore all against him. You can't trust a concubine. And went away from him unto her father's house to Bethlehem, Judah, and was there four whole months. Now, the rest of the scripture here goes along, and basically he gets a young boy to go with him, and they go to get her and take her back. They find out that she's doing her whoring at her daddy's house. So it picks up in verse 22. Watch this. Judges... Uh, 19, 22 through 30. Here we go. Now as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain sons of the devil, that's what that word means, beset the house round about and beat at the door and spake to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring forth the man that came into thine house that we may know him. Now, that's the same, exact same thing that happened at, at Sodom. So you have these homosexuals, and they want this old man to kick this man out that went there to get his concubine. He's got his concubine, and now he's trying to get home. What does that mean, they want to know him? Well, biblically, they want to know him. And the man, the master of the house, went out unto him, and he said unto him, No, nay, my brother, no, nay. I pray you, do not so wickedly, seeing that this man has come into my house, do not this folly. Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, 
and his concubine. So here's your two women. Them I will bring out now, and humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man do not so vile a thing. But the men would not hearken to him. So the man took his concubine, and brought her forth unto them, and they knew her, and they abused her all the night until the morning. And when the day began to spring, they let her go. Well, that was mighty kind of them, wasn't it? Then came the woman to the dawning of the day, in the dawning of the day, and she fell down at the door of the man's house where her Lord was till it was light. And her Lord rose up in the morning and opened the door of the house, and he went out to go his way. And behold, the woman, his concubine, was fallen down at the door of the house, and her hands were upon the threshold. And he said unto her, Up, and let us be going. But none answered. Then the man took her up upon an ass, and the man rose up, and he got him into his place. So he took her back home. And when he was coming to his house, he took a knife, and he laid hold of his concubine, and he divided her together with her bones into twelve pieces, and he sent her into all the coast of Israel, unto every tribe. And it was so that all that saw it said there was no such deed done nor seen from the day that the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt until this day, consider of it, take advice and speak your minds. Now, what you think initially is that they were flabbergasted that this guy cut up his concubine and mailed them or FedExed them to every tribe, but that's not true. They couldn't believe what had happened to this woman. So something that these people did to this woman, you could see readily on every piece of her body. What in the world did they do? So look at Judges 20, 11. So all the men of Israel were gathered against the city, knit together as one man. When these tribes saw these pieces of this body, they all came together to destroy these sodomites. Because of what they seen on the body, what in the world did they do? Now, these people are willing to die to stamp this stuff out of their nation. But I want you to see something. The tribe of Benjamin is willing to die to keep them. Now, you just think for just five seconds, they must be very valuable and very coveted to the tribe of Benjamin where they're living. What could they have in their possession that the tribe of Benjamin would be willing to die for. Maybe they're hooked too, right? And the tribes of Israel sent men throughout all the tribe of Benjamin saying, what wickedness is this that is done among you? There's some kind of wickedness being done. Now therefore deliver us the men, the children of the devil, which are in uh, Gibeah, that we may put them to death and put away evil from Israel. But the children of Benjamin would not hearken to the voice of their brethren, the children of Israel. But the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together out of the cities unto Gibeah to go out to battle against the children of Israel. They had a civil war, and you can read about it. It was terrible. Why doesn't Benjamin want this evil out of their land? So, that's where I left you last time, right? So, I got this text from uh, Wednesday night's top student. This is what she says. It blew my mind. This text from a student that was in class Wednesday night. It says, hi, Sherman. This is uh, Sally. Sending you my far-out answer to your question. Why did the body parts of the woman get sent to the 12 tribes? to show them the exceedingly great sin the sodomites were doing, eating the flesh and drinking the blood of a human? Why was that exceedingly sinful, question mark? The bread and wine in the Old Testament is a foreshadowing of Jesus who gives his flesh and blood for forgiveness of our sin. 
So when people eat and drink human flesh and blood as a sacrifice to other gods, they are committing the ultimate sin of disbelief, which will lead to their destruction. That's why Sodom and was destroyed. P.S. They have raped and tortured the woman first to get her adrenal chrome levels up before eating her flesh and drinking her blood. Is this a correct answer to your Bible study question? <laughs> I couldn't have said it any better. That is amazing. I left you with this last time, Isaiah 6, 11. Watch this. After, after it was over Wednesday night, David came up and he said, man, once you get on that cannibalism, it's all through the Bible. It's crazy. It's like, how have I missed this? Watch this. Then said I, Lord, how long? Now, this is Isaiah giving a prophecy to when Jesus comes back. It's going to get real bad before Jesus comes back. How long? And he answered, till the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. Verse 12. And the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. Well, that's going to be a terrible day. But yet in it shall be a tent. That's what ties it to a tithe. Yet there's going to be a remnant. There's going to be a tent. And it shall return and shall be eaten as a teal tree, as an oak, whose substance is in them. When they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. The holy seed in this verse is talking about people. People. What in the world are you talking about? It looks like in the tribulation, the Jews that believe in Jesus will be sacrificed on an altar and somehow consumed or eaten. It will be a remnant or a tenth or a tithe. Look at Psalm 16.4. Psalm 16.4, Their sorrow shall be multiplied, that hasten after another god. Their drink offering of blood will I not offer, nor take up their names into my lips. There is no such thing as a drink offering of blood. But there's going to be. Look at Micah 3, verse 1. Micah 3, 1, and I said here, I pray ye, O heads of Jacob, and ye princes of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know judgment? They're going to be judged, all right. Who hate the good and love the evil, who pluck off their skin from off of them and their flesh off of their bones? Well, that's happened once before, hadn't it? Who can remember in your lifetime when the Jewish people had their sin plucked off of them? Not their sin, their skin. In Auschwitz, in World War II, they skinned them, a lot. they skinned them, they made lampshades out of their skin. They made billfolds. People all over Germany area had billfolds made out of human skin. They had factories. This verse is pretty potent. Who also eat the flesh of my people. Huh? I don't think they did that in World War II. They starved them until there wasn't a whole lot of flesh left. And flay their skin from off of them and they break their bones and chop them in pieces as for the pot and as flesh within the cauldron. That sounds like they're cooking them. Then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time as they have behaved themselves ill in their doings. What are these verses? Well, now look at this verse, Revelation 6, verse 9. Maybe this verse will speak to you in a little different way. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar, what, what is laid on an altar? A sacrifice. Under the altar, the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? You're avenging their blood. And white robes were given unto 
every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So somebody's going to kill them. Somebody's going to kill this remnant. Look at Revelation 24. Well, how does the Bible say they're going to get killed? Does it tell you? Sure it does. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon him, them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. And when had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received a mark. Well, who, who was the first soul that went under that altar? Probably John the Baptist. It seems like the devil likes cutting people's heads off. Why would he want to cut your head off? Because he's humane and it's easy. I mean, you die and it's a painless way to die. I don't think so. I think there's something else that you might need to know. Um, look at this, the two witnesses, when the two witnesses come. And notice this, Revelations 11, verse 7 through 9. Notice what it keeps saying about them. When they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that has sent out the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. So these two witnesses are going to be killed and they're dead bodies. Notice that. It says dead bodies. It says it three times. Is that a hint? <laughs> I don't know. Shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. Why does it in this verse tie Jerusalem back to Sodom and back to Egypt? And we know both places had this practice. Watch. Well, also our Lord was crucified. So if you think he's talking about Sodom or if you think he's talking about Egypt, he just clarified it for you. The Holy Spirit is calling Jerusalem, Sodom, and Egypt to somehow reference or tie you back to those two places. Watch. And, and they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days. That's dead bodies again. And a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Well, I'm just saying, maybe all they there is their dead bodies. Maybe they had their heads cut off. We know that's how they're going to be killing Jews from Revelation 20. We know that's the process. Well, why are they decapitated? Does the Bible say anything about that? Why would the devil want to decapitate people? I think it's because God demanded that all sacrifices offered to him were to be decapitated. So the devil does it as well. Look at Revelation 17, 5 and 6. And we're almost done. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon. Now, this woman that metaphorically rides the beast system is a false, demonic, devilish, religious system. Okay? So when it talks about this whore or this woman, that's a religious system. It's called Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman, watch this, drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. She's drunk with the blood. Remember, I told you it's very intoxicating. So let's go to Leviticus chapter 1, verse 4. I want you to see this. This is what God demanded. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. This is the process for every sacrifice in the Levitical Jewish law. And he shall kill the bullock before the Lord, and the priest Aaron's son shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood round about upon the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. And the sons of Aaron, the priest, shall put fire upon the altar and lay the wood in order upon the fire. And the priest Aaron's son shall lay the parts, the head, <laughs> separate, and the fat in order upon the wood that is on the fire which is upon the altar. 
So he must have had its head cut off, right? Well, if you don't believe me, watch. But his inwards and his legs shall be washed in water, and the priest shall burn all on the altar to be burnt sacrifice, to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. And if this offering be of the flocks, namely of the sheep or of the goats for a burnt sacrifice, he shall bring it a male without blemish. And he shall kill it on the side of the altar northward before the Lord, and the priest Aaron's son shall sprinkle his blood round about upon the altar. And he shall cut it into pieces with his head and his fat, and the priest shall lay them in order on the wood that is on the fire which is upon the altar. But, it, but he shall wash the inwards and the legs with water, and the priest shall bring it all and burn it upon the altar. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. And if the burnt sacrifice for his offering to the Lord be of fowls, then he shall bring his offering of turtle doves or of young pigeons. Watch it. And the priest shall bring it into the altar and wring off his head and burn it on the altar, and the blood thereof shall be wrung out at the side of the altar. And he shall pluck away his crop with the feathers and cast it beside the altar on the east part by the place of the ashes. And he shall cleave it with the wings thereof, but shall not divide it asunder. And the priest shall burn it upon the altar, upon the wood that is upon the fire. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. Maybe that's why throughout history the devil has decapitated people. This book is beyond finding out. This Melchizedek, I believe he was God. I believe he taught Abraham. I believe he interacted with him for years. I believe Abraham knew him by sight. He knew what his voice sounded like. He knew him afar off. And the writer of Hebrews is trying his best to tell us, thank you for coming. We're going to pray and dismiss. We'll give you time to go to the bathroom, and then we'll come back and have our little short meeting, okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father. We come to you in the mighty name of Jesus, and we thank you for your word. It's so hard sometimes to even fathom the things that are yet to be upon this earth. You said in your Bible that men's heart would fear for the thing coming upon the earth. We have no idea what is in store for this earth. Help us to redeem the time. And understand that all we have is today and that we spend that day in honor of you. We thank you for today. We ask you to be with us in our business meeting and understand it's your business and that we conduct ourselves like Christian people. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, folks. We'll give you about five or ten.